Welcome to Above the Garage. Hi, friends. Welcome to our Shining Girls episode six analysis. This episode was directed by Dana Reed. And let's do a round of introductions and dive in. Hi, I'm Diana. Hi, I'm Helen. Hi, I'm Ginger. Hi, I'm Kimberly. Hi, I'm Violet. And I'm Kate. So this episode was incredible, right? Yes. So much happened. I loved it so much. And I absolutely love how it opens with Kirby and Clara, which in my brain are just Lizzie and Maddie dancing at Mm -hmm. a bar because it's a little Handmaid's Tale crossover since they always wanted to go dancing and drinking together. Very exciting. And also, like, we didn't know if the picture that they released maybe was just a behind the scenes shot, but no, they actually get to meet. Yeah. It seems so real life. I mean, they're obviously friends in real life. So, and you could mm-hmm. tell. Yeah. Like, it came across. I love them both blonde, too. They look great. They look great in whatever hair color they have, but I enjoyed this look. And then their video fades out to gas coming in, and suddenly we're in Campini in 1918 with Harper and Leo and a soldier runs by them yelling like masks on and Harper sees the incoming gas and he turns to actually like run away from battle I believe but he runs yeah yeah, and he runs into Leo who makes him turn around and but also makes him put his mask on at least and then quickly after they're running forward again they get hit with enemy fire and the glass in Harper's mask breaks so he holds his breath as he runs to find somebody else's mask and the first guy that he could find with a mask was alive but that did not stop harper from taking said mask and uh knifing him in the side to make that easier for him was it mustard gas by the way is that what that was i think so yeah it had the right color uh, the three gases used in world war one were chlorine phosgene and mustard gas i wonder if he's the first person that he that he killed i think so I don't know why, I just think so. Yeah, I had the same thought. It was to save his own life. I'm not saying that it was right either, but he moves beyond that yeah. later in his life. It seemed like a first step for him. Right. Killing a guy who was dying already. Gateway drug. To save his own life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good. That's a good term for it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then we see Clara, Maddie's character, dancing in a club with radium painted all over her body to make her glow in the dark. She is dancing a seemingly serious dance to a small club, and as she closes her act in French, which Yuli is not here, I don't know if anyone speaks French, but the end was Bonne Nuit, which I assume is good night. But she sees Harper in the club and she freezes, and she looks scared to me at first. Uh, I'm not sure if that's accurate, what you guys thought. She looked like she didn't want to see him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The first time I thought that she was like surprised and maybe because she smiled a little. No, she didn't. She stopped her smiling and then smiled again. So I, I was very confused. But the second time I, mm-hmm. I concluded that she didn't want to see him. Yeah. I think the smile, it, it reminded me of like myself trying to do like be polite, but also uncomfortable. Like in a situation where you're like, I don't want to look like a jerk, but like, I don't want this to be happening. So I'm just going to kind of like try to get through it. That's what Mm -hmm. it seemed like to me. But based on how the rest of the episode goes, I feel like that tracks. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) He's clearly uncomfortable with him often. Yeah. And I think her, I think her stage mask just slipped and she had to, when she Mm re-smiles, it's because she's performing again. But then he's in her dressing room with her and they're being fairly chummy although she still is giving off the vibe that she wishes he wasn't there she's letting him be there you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's the dressing room that kirby was in yes. a few episodes ago i love that same mirror too i believe that she's looking at isn't it they look the same to me but i guess we could compare the pictures yeah it looked like where kirby was standing, standing in the episode right. where we saw her looking at her reflection right that's really cool i love that and i found it interesting that harper uh, stands next to um clara at the beginning uh-huh. but then he moves behind her and they're reflected in the same uh, mirror ah, it, it looks like his he moves into his space and then they're connected through the mirror oh, and that's interesting silka louisa the showrunner did actually say that the use of so many mirrors is to disorient the viewers and i think it's really effective in that in yeah the different episodes and that was placed by Michelle McLaren, I think, in the first episode she directed. Pretty cool. It works. Mm-hmm. I love Maddie's literal line in this where she says, they handed out medals to everyone. How many did you get? And he's like, oh, this is the ride. And I was like, ooh, burn. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of striking to me how bare his uniform is. I feel like we're used to seeing uniforms with things on them. And then I wondered, is he was he dishonorably discharged? Is that why 
not making it to Paris seems like a thing. Then he's asking, like, I tried to find you where, where'd you go? I went to Teenies. I guess she used to work at Teenies. And she's like, I got out of there as quickly as I could, but I traveled. I did the Orpheum Circuit, which was a chain of like vaudeville and later movie theaters where troops of sometimes 15 to 17 acts would perform together. And they started to go out of business in the 20s when the movies started to take over the scene. But she asked how the war was, like you said, and she's nice though after he says I got no medals she's like I you know it must have been bad over there or something she's not entirely like mean to him by any means but he is to her you know I don't know Jamie Bell is so good in this occasionally I like feel bad for him for a second I'm like oh he likes her and she doesn't like him he's really really good though at turning on the charm like very effectively and then turning it off immediately yeah yeah, it's like, it's creepy, but it's so good. He turns it off, though, when he's, um, it's like he just wants to talk about himself and, you know, she's talking about her performance and stuff like that. And he's just like, oh, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was shit, blah, blah, blah. And she's just like, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, he's rude to her about her performance. He tries to make everything that everybody else is doing seem like insignificant. Yeah. Right. Quick note on the uh, his performance in War again. It reminded me that Leo used to run away from the home he was in until he saw the movie Paths of Glory and that calmed him and that movie is about like cowardice and war and being court-martialed for running from battle and such so relevant okay so he tells her he wrote her and she says she never got the letters and deflects and asks what he thought her dance was about which you were just saying and it was supposed to be about Josephine who was the first wife of Napoleon and interestingly Napoleon was known to love Josephine much more than she loved him and he would like write her love letters that she never returned And after their marriage, he was said to have kept a picture of her in his pocket, which he would plant many kisses on every passing hour. Josephine, however, never even looked at the picture of her new husband that Napoleon gave her. They ended up being annulled because she couldn't have children, but I I read that on his deathbed, he was like talking about her. So the obsession was real. Yeah. So he says, I don't think anybody got that from the show, which isn't cool. And she tells him she might get the Balaban, which I think is a theater in Chicago. And he says it doesn't look like there are many people there. So he just keeps demeaning her and not building her up. Um, And he says he brought her something. And she's pissed off because he's been dick to her right now. And and says, what makes you think I want that? And he says, you may speak French now, but I still know you. And then um, when when he gives her the floral handkerchief, she notices it's been sewn. So my note that I wrote then was that it probably killed somebody. That's how it ran into his pocket knife to get it. But we find out later. Yeah, I thought maybe he like cut blood, like a blood stain off of it or something. Uh huh. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so then they're on the fire escape watching a woman that I guess was a nun in the, I guess the orphanage maybe that they were in growing up. That was my assumption. Sister Flora from St. Michael's. And now she feeds the poor at St. Adelbert's. And then when she leaves, he wants to break into the house and Clara protests at first, but then she follows Harper in. Um, So she's trying on Flora's furs. And this is when we see the conversation from the trailer between Clara and Harper, where she says he's always watching and he used to peep from under the cattle box on her like a little rat. Which I think that was significant, though, because like he she said he used to spy on her. And I feel like it shows like he's always been creepy and like watching people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she says that, like, because they were being kind of playful with their conversation. And then as soon as she says, like, you know, calls him a little rat and says he was spying on her, like instantly his demeanor changed and he looked sinister now. Yeah. So I feel like she gets saved in that moment, maybe by the watch beeping, because I think he was probably angry about the rat comment. Well, he seemed offended too, like that she didn't understand what his motives are because he's like, I was trying to look out for you. Right. But obviously it didn't feel like that to her, even as a child. Right. And I mean, considering how the episode ends, I have a hard time buying that as well. I have in my notes, uh, the, the quote, I was looking out for you, the Harper said. Yeah. And I have in, in parentheses, love me. It's like, <laughs> hello, I was there because I wanted to protect you. And now yes. I thought it was obvious that, you know, right. I want more and please love me. And I thought of you guys watch Friends or watch Friends. Of course. Uh, there was in the, the first season, the Roger, the therapist, he said that all the Friends group, they were like kind of wanting to be defined and love me, define me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly how Harper felt for me in that moment. Even later in the episode, I'm surprised that he like keeps having to state what he wants, but he does it like yeah. first year, basically. Yeah. 
and and you can see that she knows but yes. she doesn't want the attention please don't say that maybe we can be friends but like yeah can't you yeah. pick up on my signals you know I think that happens though, like as women sometimes, especially if you have a guy friend who's into you or somebody just in general who you're not into, but they like you, like you're trying to be nice, yeah, not shoot them down and say, no, I'm, I don't like you that way. Like you can tell she's very uncomfortable, but instead of saying anything about it, she just keeps trying to change the subject. Yeah. It's a very difficult line to walk without hurting somebody, but also giving clear signals. And she's giving clear signals. He's just not picking up on them or refusing to. I noticed that she that she wanted to say something in that moment, but she was like, ah, like opening her mouth and the, yeah. the, the watch beeps. sound beeps and yeah. interrupts. Yeah. But it's like the whole night is like that, like she wants to say so, but something prevents her. I'm uh-huh. doing it. I think she's scared of him. Yeah, I agree. I think she doesn't want to set him off. Yeah, I wonder what she's seen him do. Like growing up with him, I wonder if he like hurt animals or things like that. You know, I'm sure she knows more creepy things about him than we do. So yes, the watch starts beeping, which clearly doesn't fit in this year. By the way, at first I thought it was a Geiger counter, and they were going to realize that she was radioactive, but that's not the direction this went. It is a watch from the future with a map of the world on it. And he says, it's different now. How did it do that? I'm not sure what he meant by what changed right then. But the face is also glowing, which kind of ties in with the whole radium girl thing at this point. And then Flora comes back for her umbrella. So many umbrellas in this show. Obviously, the showrunner is an umbrella person, Silica. (laughs) And then Sister Flora immediately remembers her for not praying before the free meal. And he pins her against the wall with the umbrella. And she calls him a small man. Uh, Harper says, you don't think I know who you are. That's your husband's picture on your dresser. You like that same candle form every night. I've been watching you. Where did you get the watch? When she calls him a small man, though, like obviously he pushes her against the wall and is being kind of violent, but he almost seemed like he was holding back a little. And then as soon as she called him a small man, it triggered him. He's got small man syndrome. Yes, exactly. Napoleon. Yeah. I, I think that small man thing is like very, is key for for her pers- uh, personality. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Jamie Bell has said that actually he kills because he doesn't want to feel smaller than, like he, when he feels inferior. You know, yeah, uh, that's what when he reacts. And in this uh, episode, they mentioned that actually Clara she said that at the at the end, and that's what also triggers him. So I think that's the most important reason why he kills maybe right he's toxic masculinity like small man giant ego he's also a coward i'm a little bit unclear like when i was watching it i was like okay so he's been time traveling already because he says i know what that is like where did you get it i thought that too but i think it's just him watching them because later on i was like wait no i don't think he has before what do you guys think is this the first? i don't think so no i don't think i think so. i think it's what yeah. kimberly said i think he's just been watching and just probably has seen a lot of what they've been doing and I wondered if maybe he had already seen maybe other objects or something going through the house that seemed weird and Mm -hmm. that was maybe part of why he wanted to be inside the house and that makes sense too because why is he like spying on this old lady all the time he's very fixated on it yeah well they said Clara actually taught him how to spy on people when they were little and so maybe it was just something that like he ties to her nostalgia right yeah and he just enjoys doing it so he kept doing it but didn't it make it seem like he's purposely been like stalking this nun anyway yeah like he's, yeah. Going, mm-hmm. he's yeah. going there regularly but obviously not participating in prayers yeah he was saying she wears the shit stockings or something and she keeps the silk stockings for other outings instead of her charitable that meetings makes sense. Or- yeah, yeah it's rayon's shitty and silk is good yeah <laughs> Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I don't know my stocking. But when Harper takes out the watch out of the drawer, he says, it's different now. Yeah, I thought that too. It was weird. So it sounds to me like they lived through that moment a couple of times and now she has something else in the drawer or the watch looks different than before. Did the watch face change? It didn't. I watched. Like, Africa was blinking and it stopped blinking. That's the only thing that you could say, like, changed. The time didn't change. I couldn't identify anything else to change. So I actually like Helen's idea that he has been through this... I thought maybe he had seen the watch before, though. Like, while he was spying on them, he'd seen the watch. So he was like, I I feel like maybe even going after the watch because he had been seeing it and noticed that it was either valuable or strange. Yeah, 
and because that kind of watch changes where you are it's a time zone watch so it can change from a different country a different time zone so yeah i think that must be it then. do we know which year it is it's 19 1920 when he comes outside with her okay. and shows her the watch it says it's sunday october 24th it said 10 24 at 5 59 p.m but he, they found the house on october 9th yes 9th. that's what confuses me but maybe this watch oh, is just well. wrong. Maybe this watch has the wrong date. I, I think he already went already there with uh, with Clara a couple of times. That's why he notices that it watch different. The when they go into the house and discover the house, why would he be re- redoing that over and over again? Do you know what I'm saying? Like that's yeah. the part that I don't. Maybe he's not quite... though. Maybe he's only maybe he's not certain certain moments. No, yeah, I, that's I, true. That's true. And yeah. I think we see the moment they discover the house comes after the scene with Clara, but it's not chronologically after but just showed in the show yeah he's like going back to that day because he had a good a good memory from that day with her or something yeah that makes sense sunday october 24th is the watch and october 9th 1920 is when he goes to the house <laughs> now it would imply that it's not the first time that he's been in yeah. yeah yeah i'm sold on that now all right where the hell are we so he takes the the watch is a seiko world timer alarm which was made from 1977 to 1988 and he takes it out to clara who doesn't like that he stole it but then he shows it to her and she looks pretty happy i think they interlock fingers so i do think in that part in that scene though it's interesting because he seems like unhappy that this woman is hustling and that she's being cheap like with the stockings and everything and then he does say a line something about taking what he's owed we need to take what, what we're owed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which I think just kind of, again, speaks to like his motives and why he does things and who he is. And he's entitled for no reason whatsoever. Yep. Um, then Harper's walking up to Leo and this is before they found the house and Leo's spinning a bullet and conning people somehow. And Harper tells him he's going to con the wrong person sometime. Uh, and Leo's different than what we've been used to for me anyway. And the past episodes he's more confident and he's a little bit more the alpha for now i guess and uh he can tell that harper's got a scam on his brain and he stops him and, and makes him tell him what it is and says go grab let, let's go grab our kits and then go they get there and you see harper turn over the photo with the address 2925 lakeview street on the back and it's the photo from sister flora's apartment of the husband and he says it's not what i thought it would look like and he was like what does that mean i guess he thought it was going to be fancier and leo picks the lock and harper's nervous which seems odd. He says there's an inch of dust on the shutters. Nobody's here. And they go in and the house is just like full of curiosities. And Leo starts picking him up and putting him in his backpack. He seems nervous though, like the whole time they're in there because he keeps asking, like he seems antsy, but then he keeps asking like, are you sure he's not home? Are you sure somebody's not home? I think this definitely is the first time. That's just the first time, yeah. Yes, yeah. No, they are wearing different clothes. They have the uh, soldier uniforms when they go there and they have their coin buckets with them so yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's i guess the scene doesn't follow the scene that was before when they play the coin game and decide to... i think it is because um uh, leo says we should change into our kits yeah but harper says what do we need kits for i think it's because so they don't look suspicious yeah they're allowed to go you know, door to collecting door. money yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Harper was like, why do we need that? And then Leah was like, just ignored that comment and just still went back to the house. Okay. And got it. Stick with me, kid. Okay. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> yeah. like back slap because yeah. that's their reason for going door to door. Also, theory. side note, when when they were saying like, oh, there's an inch of dust on the shutters. No one lives here. I was like personally offended. So there's an inch of dust on my shutters and I live <laughs> That's a call out. <laughs> I know. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> it's funny, too, that he keeps saying that nobody's home because all the lights in the house are on. Like, when they get inside the house, all the lamps are turned on. And, and Leo's like, no, nobody's home. Yeah, true. Also, I love the room where the light's coming through the curtains and it looks like a movie projector. I guess yeah. it happens in a couple rooms here, but I would like to get those curtains. That's a cool effect. That's the moment when you can see, you know, the glass that they've been doing, the, um, the effect when Harper's looking at the window and he's got the light on his hand. It's a cool shot. Yeah, he holds his hand out. Yeah. And then, like that beam like goes right in the middle of his palm. Yeah. He also heard the, um, you know, the rumbling behind the walls that we've been hearing, I think, when things change. Was that the same kind of music they were playing? noise that's what i was wondering because he he was being like suspicious again before that because right before he put his ear to the wall he asked again are you sure no one's home and then he leaned in and listened i think it might be the same noise like when his coffee cup changed right 
and he says, who covers up their windows like this? What's he so scared of? And then as Harper walks upstairs, it focuses like on this weird ram's horn. And maybe will be significant in the future. Yeah. I had an old bat when he finds the um, almanac because uh, actually I was checking the opening credits. I noticed different things about it, uh, each episode. Yeah. They change a little bit. They have an, an object. Mm-hmm. So the first episode uh, has the keychain. Uh, the second is Julia's tape. Uh, the third one are the photos for, from the victims, because in that episode they discover the, the, the different victims. The four is the silence is deafening button campaign, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the five is the VHS tape, and six is the digital watch. Uh, in the the screen when they say uh, based on the novel by Lorraine Bukes, like all the all the elements are the same, but that one changes and is that one. But the other element that is always there is the almanac. And I thought at the beginning that was the, the Kirby's notes. Oops, uh-huh, the notes. Right. But no, it's, it's the almanac because oh. it has lines and has like this writing and it's in another language. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not Kirby's notebook, it's the almanac. So maybe that almanac is going to be important later. Oh, interesting. Yes, good observation. <laughs> that almanac reminded me of um, Back to the Future. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Biff, yeah. When That's Biff true. finds the sports almanac and he takes it to his younger self so he can... Um, bet on the sporting events and become rich it's a good point i wonder if that's what he does and that's how he collects all his money i'd like to do that did you guys i don't know any of you that grew up in the 80s did you ever play the game mist no yes computer game yes that's what i felt like like looking around this room for like clues yeah all right so leo finds a suitcase full of money uh that belongs to john c nelson possibly the guy upstairs with different $20 bills, you can compare and see that they're from different times. Um, one of them is, I think, from 1990. I don't know if this means anything, but when Harper's going up the stairs, you like see the front doors and it looks like the door is slightly open, like just like a crack. Did you guys notice that? I did not notice. Oh. I was trying to determine if that was, I mean, they came in through the back. So those had to have been the front doors. And it, yeah, it just seemed odd. It seemed like somebody had been through the door since they've they been in the house. On it, so that's weird. Yeah, like I wondered if maybe the guy arrived while they were there or something. I don't know. That's good observation. And then Harper finds the guy that lives there and he comes out of the closet with a gun trained on him. And the guy asks what day it is, what war he fought in because he's wearing his kit. And Leo says, it's October 9th, 1920. Why don't you know that? And they talk about the watch. And the guy's like, oh, so you're a craftsman. And Harper creepily says, I could be. And then I like when the guy says, no, you don't make things. You just want them. I love that one. Sums him up really nicely. He got his number quickly. Yeah. And then Leo downstairs has turned on Jim Croce's operator. This is one of the few songs I didn't have to Google. And it shocks. It gives Harper the advantage because it throws off the owner of the house. So he's on the floor, the owner of the house, and he says, so you will want it now, right? Maybe it's for the better. I can find a time to make my own. You'll see. We can only pass through here. Until then, the house has its own ways. And he makes a run for it because he's like, whatever time I come out and, you know, I'll just make a life. But I, I also have another that the man says, so you will want it now. But he's not asking a question. He's like, oh, you will want yeah. it now. But, and I think... That's like a kind of transaction, like when it's like, yeah, oh, okay, this is your house now, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or something like that, because later, Harper is the only one who can actually yeah. know, play with its powers. Um, so I think that's the moment where he hands over the deed. I like yeah. it. Yeah. I wonder how that guy came about. I'd love to see this guy's backstory, and um, yeah. that's probably like a spin off because <laughs> we only have two episodes left. I'd love to see how the house works, how someone discovered it, where it's from, how why, this been when, how, where, <laughs> all, the, all the W's. We could do a prequel season for you. Yeah. So then he runs out and he gets hit by a car immediately and Harper's like chasing him with a gun and he's like, it's funny how he puts the gun behind his back so as to hide it. And it's clearly like the 1950s. That was my guess too. I didn't see any exact. No, I have is that the car that's next to the car that hits him is the Ford Plymouth, and that model was around in the 1950s. Oh, nice. So he obviously thought of the 50s while he was running out of the house, right? That's yeah. where that's where he wanted to run out to? Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's where he's from originally. 
I think yeah. he was in like a big hurry, so just picked. I don't time. know how much thought he put into it, but hopefully he must have liked the fifties. Yeah, yeah, it's meaningful for some reason, maybe. Right. Harper goes to visit Clara again, and she's got this. She's obviously suffering from like the radium at this point, the radiation, but she's got this mask on that looks like a gas mask, just like a breathing treatment. Is it supposed to be like a? old-fashioned like nebulizer or something yes, maybe that's what yeah I was thinking. it's for like tuberculosis and stuff i think right right well, i just thought it was funny that she's like coughing up a lung and it's like oh it makes my chest clear I'm like oh clearly that's working out well for you well i mean if you read about radium back then it's so insane they used to treat things like colds with it they tell you to put it in your water and shit and people did it and it's crazy it's so sad reading about the radium girls and it's cool though side note even though they all died that worked in that watch factory that were dying from radium um even though they all died before they could really get any justice because of them there are labor laws like now in america that prevent these things from happening so hmm. you mattered cool. radium girls yeah so clara's breathing the mask and he says lay down let's lay down on the floor but he's concerned about her and he's wearing a suit that doesn't look entirely put together and seems kind of i don't know it seems like he's been doing something before he comes here he's been busy testing out the powers of the house yeah did you notice that when Harper comes to see Clara that he has like a 50s haircut with sideburns? Oh. So it kind of feels to me that it's a good call. He went to that moment, I don't know why, then lived in the 50s for a while, get a haircut, and then came back to Clara a week later. So like right after the guy gets hit by the car, he just walks to the barber. And his clothes look a bit more modern than 1920s as well. Maybe it took him a few times of actually encountering the guy that originally was like running the house to get the timing right on him dying. I don't know. Because when he walks out the door and gets hit by the car. Yeah. So she says she's going to audition for the battle band tomorrow, which is kind of sad because she's not looking so good. But he says, why don't you come back to my house to get ready? And she's like, oh, what? You got a wife now, too? She says, how'd you like, how'd you do all this in the last week? So only been a week in her time he picks up the radium box in the dressing room so we see the radium box for the first time what she uses for her performance then they go to the house and they're laying on the floor he tells her like he makes sure she keeps watching and as she does the chandelier changes into a completely different really pretty chandelier i really like blue and purple together but she asks how he changed it and he says he didn't it changed on its own inside here things become something else Sometimes they're older, sometimes they're newer, sometimes they're just different. Things I've never seen before. Could happen to anything, carpets, clamps, whatever. So, do you think it changed because of his mood, or do you think it just changes randomly? It was interesting because he obviously kind of expected that particular object to change, right? Yeah. He's having her stare at it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm not sure, like, but then he says he's not doing it. So I don't know if he just doesn't know he's doing it. But when he stares yeah. at something, it changes and he just has noticed that that happens. Yeah. The only thing that I, that came up was he was getting a bit antsy that it hadn't changed yet. And um, Clara was just like, you know, what are we doing? Distracted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are we doing? So maybe he got upset and that changed it. That's interesting. Oh, the thing that doesn't change in the house, what I've noticed is the the time on the, oh, yeah, on the, clock. On the big yeah. clock. Yeah. It's three or five at yeah. the time it's shown. <laughs> So the inside of the house is frozen at a particular time. Mm -hmm. I would say it's not nowhere. In, in, no, in no time, nowhere. No place. It's suspended <laughs> somewhere on the border between the realms. <laughs> or <Yeah>. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> the physical and the metaphorical. Or, Whoa, yeah. we're getting deep. Because time doesn't move when you're inside the house, obviously, since when you yeah. walk out, it's whatever yeah. time you think of. So it's not, it's not like you're going through yeah. linear time inside the house. You're just existing in a separate... Space, and, right? A separate and the light universe. that comes inside, it, it's not natural. It's like vibrating. So it looks uh, like yeah. the house is inside of some white space. Mm, yeah. I think the purpose of that light effect and the sound, the vibrating sound, is that like to show that that house is like in some kind of space time <laughs> limbo or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, I guess that would explain why he doesn't age. If he doesn't age, we haven't quite figured that out. We don't know how long he's been doing this, but I guess he wouldn't age in a timeless place. Yeah, he probably only ages when he's like not in the house. Right, which he can't do for more than a day. Back to Clara and Harper. She says, if this place were mine, I wouldn't leave it to anyone. Nobody just let you walk in here. So she knows that he's stolen it or killed somebody or whatever. And he says, well, we're not leaving now. I love how he says that um, 
the tennis brother or something yeah. and he says he was an importer was it the last episode you were on helen where we were talking about something from seinfeld yeah yeah and this just reminded oh, me of yeah. seinfeld again because he said he was an importer george wanted to go on a date with marissa tomei his character but he was trying to tell his wife where he was going so elaine was his alibi and then the wife was asking so uh Vandalay Industries, do? right? Vandalay yes. Industries. Yes, yes, yes. Like, yes. Okay. The importer export. Vandalay, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So then she's like, she's still grilling him about whose it is and how it works and all that. And he's like, all right, fine, let's let's leave. And grabs her hand and he's like, where should we go? Think of a time, any time. And she says, a thousand years from now. And he's like, no, not that time. <laughs> and she's like, okay, as far from here as possible. And they appear in modern Chicago relatively speaking modern and she says we shouldn't be here and he says why it's no different than looking in someone else's window and i like when she says everything else is supposed to be here not us scarlet actually had a note about this time because they're playing the song passing me by by far side which is a 1993 song mm-hmm. so i think she was saying like it's she thought it was 1993 i think was she's the year. correct yeah yeah the fourth verse of this song i'm just gonna read the whole verse now there she goes again, the dopest Ethiopian, and now the world around me begins moving in slow motion whenever she happens to walk by. Why does the apple of my eye overlook and disregard my feelings no matter how much I try? Wait, no, I did not really pursue my little princess with persistence, and I was so low-key that she was unaware of my existence. From a distance, I desired her, secretly admired her, wired her a letter to get to her, and it went, my dear, my dear, my dear, you do not know me, but I know you. Very well now, let me tell you about the feelings I have for you. When I try or make some sort of attempt, I simp, damn, I wish I wasn't such a wimp. Because then I would let you know that I love you so. And if I was your man, then I would be true. The only lying I would do is in the bed with you. Then I signed, sincerely, the one who loves you dearly. P.S. Love me tender. The letter came back three days later. Return to sender. Damn. I actually quite enjoyed that. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. spot on. Yeah. Good rhymes. <laughs> that was a good performance. And this is the moment Harper ask about, asks about the letters, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, so, by the way, the music supervisor on this show is Maggie Phillips. The choices just like blow my mind with their accuracy. Not just like the sound is perfect for the scene, but the lyrics, just like you just read, are almost always like spot on to what we're seeing in the show. So that's amazing. She must have an insane knowledge of all the songs. I would like to have her on my pub quiz team. It's a pretty cool job, I reckon. Although yeah. Although it'd be... It would be hard to find, but I guess once you have like a catalog of songs, I think it would be a pretty cool job to pick music for TV shows. Well, she does have her Handmaid's Tale too, which obviously yeah. this is like an enormous part of the show that really elevates it. And every song on that show, like very accurately goes along with whatever scene or episode they're filming. So she's very good at her mm-hmm. job. She's amazing. Totally. This is when she says, why can't you go further than today? I don't know. I just can't. And if he tries to go further, he ends up at the first day. He went to the house. She says, why is today the last day? Yeah, I, I know we kind of like had thought maybe he could have, Harper couldn't go past that day because he dies then, like in some timeline. But then we were talking about the original, or I don't know if it's the original, but the previous owner of the house. He dies in the he 50s, dies in the, though. In the and 50s, he, yep. And he has exactly. a lot of stuff in the future from 90s, the 90s, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So yeah. that kind of makes it seem like... He, that man wouldn't have been able to go past the fifties if that's the case, which actually blows apart the idea that, um, to me, it kind of, yeah, that Harper's death day is the day that is the end. Oh, for fuck's like, sake. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I think though. I, and maybe this is totally not right, but I think that it's the day the house ends, like the day the house doesn't exist anymore. Oh. Yeah, like but- it, somebody burns it down or something. I don't know. Like, it's just like the day that it's like demolished that. or whatever. Yeah. Which that could make sense. But then my question would be, it's, it, obviously he can't be away from the house for too long because it affects him. So then if the house does burn down, then how does he... Then he's just fucked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm okay with that outcome. I'm okay yeah. with him going crazy or dying. It would be kind of like amazing if like Kirby went and burned his house down or something. Like I keep thinking about that and thinking like how cool it would be. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, mean, I like that. <laughs> I like that outcome. And that just fits with like the guy having stuff from the 90s and that being like as far as you could go. Kind of makes sense then. Okay, so yeah, he chooses now to confront her about the letters from the war that she claims she never got. 
that she did get and asked why she didn't write him back. He could have written anything. And I swear to God, you guys, I felt bad for him for like a microsecond when I remembered who I was feeling bad for. But, and I'm surprised that he would choose to confront her over and over again like this. If he wants to live in his delusional, she loves me land. I think it might have taken him a few tries though to learn about the letters because he says that he asked somebody at Teenies and they said she got the letter. So I, I don't think he just, he knew that from the beginning. You know, I think, I don't know, maybe he had the suspicion that she didn't get them because she was kind of being sketchy about it and then he went and investigated i feel like he's kind of waiting for her to tell him the truth yeah yeah i, guess, but... I thought he knew and from the outset yeah. and he didn't want to bring it up but... because maybe he asked her about the letters multiple times like when he revisits that day and maybe he's waiting to see if she'll say like i got them and admit it herself but now he's realizing i got them and you suck and i didn't want to reply to you so <laughs> yeah. back off but, and so here she deflects and they hold hands and run off to explore. She's bought herself a fur coat and he asks why it doesn't have a little fox head on it. And she says, it doesn't need one. It's fancy enough already. And then they walk in on Leo in the house and he's clearly upset because he's learned that when he tries to leave the house, the time doesn't change. He's just outside. And Harper says, well, it worked for me. Obviously, Leo's now dependent upon Harper. And he's also like, you know, you showed her. I didn't know we were doing that. Why don't we grab our buckets and start charging people to come in here? Harper says he doesn't care what he's saying. I love the shot of um when Leo gets up off the chair and he's just like Hot. twice his side. Yeah. <laughs> I like that shot too. When Leo rises up above him and says, when did this start? We found this place together. It's ours. And Harper points out, well, you can't go anywhere with it. Not without me. And then Leo says, you couldn't even get your mask on without me. And then Clara comes out looking quite modern and says, where to next, Captain? And she drags Leo with them and they go to Kirby's bar. On the way out, though, Leo does say, come on, Harp, open your door. So he's acknowledging that he's got to go with him. And then at the club, Leo's dancing like crazy and Clara and Harper are watching from the balcony and he asks what she thinks and she laughs and says she doesn't think she could make any money off of this crowd, but it's exactly the same, the same ceilings, the same floors. And on their way to the bar, she asks if he could come back to the same place over and over and he says, I don't see why not. So I wonder if this is the first time he seems happy. I never, I never know if it's the first time or not. Clara compliments Kirby's earrings and she says her ex gave them to her the first time they went out instead of flowers. And Kirby and Clara are making fast friends. Clara asks if she ever gets to dance and then Harper's annoyed and he's asked what that was about. And she says, you like her. I was trying to keep her around for you. Did you guys feel like they were being flirty though? Uh, I thought they were like I thought she was hitting on her at first and that's why Clara and Sharon slash Kirby yeah Yeah. and I thought she was mad initially and then when I rewatched it I realized that she says to him like I'm you like her I'm trying to help you she's trying to be the wingman yeah for the guy she herself doesn't want to be with right she's just trying to offload him (laughs) which I I did kind of wonder if Harper was annoyed because he thought what you just said that Clara was kind of flirting with with Sharon because she's obviously being more like flirty friendly with Sharon than she ever is with Harper right it could just be like separate jealousy just the fact that she was like being kind to her and being like you know friendly with her giving someone else attention that she yeah exactly the small man that he is Uh uh-huh and they were like ignoring him all the time you know, they never like even Sharon. She received the money, like thank you, and continued like talking to <laughs> to Clara like that. Like they were always talking, just the two of them. And maybe he felt like set aside, like ignored, and yeah. he felt small. Then he says to Clara that she's not the one I want. So vomit. Sorry. <laughs> and maybe that's what starts his interest in Kirby slash Sharon. I also find it interesting that Harper said to Kirby a couple of episodes before that they, the girls never met. Mm. They are not connected or never met. And here we see them connecting. He's a liar. I have a whole thing to like attempt to explain about all of that. And like the way that the whole episode like presents time travel. But I have a theory about that, about why they, te- they met, but they actually didn't meet. Yeah. Because what I was wondering as well, because obviously Kirby sees her in the video the vhs mm-hmm. she she didn't recognize her did she no, no. but mm-hmm. kirby also meets Ginny, who i think when she was initially killed in the first episode probably hadn't met right no maybe kirby is the key here it also could just be that she meets like 10 tons of people but to be fair i would remember 
Harper being creepy as fuck. But that's the scene, like, ahead, like, near the end when he actually takes her earrings. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm sure as a bartender, you meet a lot of creepy as fuck guys. Yeah, but that, <laughs> but, was, that was, like, extra creeptastic. Yeah. But I don't think that encounter exists on a timeline no. that Kirby has yeah. any memory of. Yeah. So Kirby, or Clara pulls Kirby onto the dance floor then, and that's the scene that we were hoping to see. And it's lovely, like I said before, watching Maddie and Lizzie dance, or Kirby and Clara in this case. Clara asks Harper to dance then, and he says no, he refuses, and he seems annoyed that she was dancing with Kirby. She's like, all right, fine, I'm going to go to the bathroom. When I come back, be ready to dance. On the way, she runs into Leo. She's kind of asking him about Harper saying that she thought he changed and he was like I think maybe you just didn't know him as well as you thought you did and I thought it was interesting that Clara said he, he just kind of takes up more space now so I guess he's just like the small man trying to be larger now I love the line from Leo about that um he always thought he couldn't dance but oh, um, no. he just didn't have the right music that sweet? Yeah. the music was that. wrong yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then they talk about Paris and learn that they never made it to Paris. But I think it was interesting how he says to her that maybe you didn't know him as well as you thought you did. I think he's always been creepy. I, he's always been like this. Like, it's not like something happened to make him snap and become a killer. Like, he's always had this in him. Yeah. And either Clara didn't know that, or I think I think she's always had the suspicion, but maybe didn't really, I don't know, recognize it or see it until now. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like she had like 50 red flags, but um, <laughs> after the time travel stuff, she was intrigued. It's a big jump to go from like, my friend is kind of awkward and maybe a little creepy to like, he's killed some people. So I feel like she's probably just like, he's a little weird. That kind of creeps me out. I'm just going to try to ignore it. And then you, yeah, and it escalates to him actually killing people. But now that he's back from war, like I, she's definitely noticing these red flags are piling up like crazy. And then yeah. now finding out like he never went to Paris and he's very good at lying because he's so charming that you, I feel like it's easy for anyone to believe him. She's already seen like poking holes through that and seeing that he's not as charming as he portrays himself to be. And then she runs into him on the way out and he has something underneath her fur coat for later, which I guess was the video camera. Yeah. Yes. Since yeah. people have been videoing them on the dance floor. And then they're back in the house and they're making the video and he's making her leave her hair down and tells her, no French, be like you, be like you were at teenies. Then she tells him, I know you didn't make it to Paris, Leo said so. And that's when we, we've seen this VHS recording from the last episode when Leo gave it to Kirby and she says, like, stop the recording, turn it off. So she grabs the handkerchief he gave her and says, tell me where you got this. I know it wasn't in Paris. And he says, he didn't have anyone to give it to. I did. And she's like, fine. Okay, just don't lie to me. What happens when you sleep here? Do you wake up still the same? And he says, when he found this place, she was the only one he wanted to show it to. And she looks uncomfortable. And he goes in to kiss her. And she jumps up. And now she wants to make the video. Like, anything to put some space between them. And then he says something very creepy. Just get back over here. You always do. So now we know it's not the first time that he's gone through this day. And she asks them, she, what do you mean always, Harper? Have we done this before? Have we come back to today, tonight, to all of this? How many times? How did you do this? And then he says, I walk out that back door. I come and find you. We go out. We come home. We always just end up here. And she said, why don't I remember? And he said, because it's not your house. So do they always, does he always end up killing her? Or is this just the one special time? I think so. I think it's the one special time. Oh, I think he kills her every time. Oh, you think so? Yeah. My thought was that he really loves this day. Or they both end up in bed together. On the other iterations, you mean? Yeah. And then I thought maybe she literally just figured it out. And that's when he kills her. He said the wrong thing. That's what I thought. Because it seems like she's acting a certain way that he wants her to. So maybe he's either reliving the day because he likes it or something happens. or maybe That's what I thought, yeah. Or maybe he's trying to get with her. And maybe he's thinking, if I keep doing this, she'll eventually sleep with me. Yeah, <laughs> it's very Groundhog's Day. But then she figures it out this time, so then he has to kill her. I wonder yeah. if the meeting with Kirby maybe has something to do with it. Yeah, maybe. Her presence altered the outcome of this day? I mean, yeah. I guess we don't really know. Do we really know that he can actually kill people twice over? No, we don't, we don't know. That. I think that he is, and the reason I think that is because with Kirby... I think the reason why her situation is like changing around her all the time 
my thought on that is that it's because he attempted to kill her so many times and every time that she lives and he doesn't know that she survived she lives a slightly different life and so she's remembering all of the different slightly different lives that she's lived like she's she's kind of like shifting her brain is shifting between all of the realities of what might have happened to her after he tried to kill her that's what I think hmm, that's interesting I hadn't really thought about that because I I still didn't work out whether he can kill them twice yeah well I guess that's the question though because Ginny gets killed in the first episode but then now we see like Kirby and her talking and it feels like things are changing there, which I, I keep asking myself, is she actually going to die or not? Right. I think the goal of it is for them to prevent that. Right. But I guess, but we don't know yet. Like, can they prevent it? I think we will find out, hopefully. In the next two episodes. <laughs> I think so, because I think- I hope Ginny doesn't die. My whole goal is for them to save her. Yeah, I think they can. I think that, okay, so Harper, he's on like a completely separate timeline from the world once he starts time traveling. What I'm thinking is like every time he, it doesn't make any sense that he wouldn't run into himself if he keeps going back to the same day over and over again, right? So the only way that I can make sense of that is thinking about his like journey through time as being a separate linear journey, even though he's going back and forth. Every time he creates a loop by going back, it's a new, like, separate sphere of, like, reality. So, like, he's just creating all of these new realities, basically. That's kind of what I think. In which case, every time, things are slightly different. Like, could be slightly different based on how people react to him. And he's he's expecting, the expectation is that they're going to be the same. So I think Kirby, like, fucking with that with Ginny is going to be, like, her being able to save Jenny in that version of him trying to kill her. Does that make sense? Yeah, I followed. Yeah, I think so. Because if he is, if he is like in a different sphere every time he travels, then it kind of makes sense why the ripple effects are happening and why things like it's almost like they seamlessly change for Kirby. Yeah. So I tried to draw it out like if, if Harper, like if a regular timeline is just left to right. Like you're saying, okay, 1918 is here. And then the last day of, of the house or of whatever, 1993 is at the other end. Then Harper, as soon as he starts time traveling, he's going up and down. He's, he's like on a separate timeline that goes this way, vertically, vertically versus horizontally. So as he's moving through his life, he's just walking straight through his life. I mean, he's not going back and then all of a sudden he's a kid. He's just walking straight forward like, the next day for him is 1992 and then the next day is 1984 and the next day is 1972 and then the next day is 1980 like he's just he's still that's still the next day for him even though he's going to all these different times right so I think like Kirby not remembering him from the bar is because that was the first time Harper met Kirby so when he goes back to her childhood he's that's like an entirely separate universe or sphere of existence <laughs> because he goes back to her childhood and everything from that point forward would be different for her because because of that encounter does that make sense yes and um side note violet is our incredible editor but she's also our time travel expert because she <laughs> is writing her own book that is amazing and it blows my mind it's so good it's amazing violet so oh thank you she's literally the best author i've ever read so i'm oh dude it's okay. so good. You're so good. You're the best writer. I can't believe Aww. it. I can't believe you waste your time editing our yes, podcast. Yes, you are. You should be writing. Oh, guys. Full time. Editing is fun. I love you. Maybe I'll fire you from your free <laughs> job. Yes. I'm glad you came on this to explain this to us. Thanks. Thank well, you. I have to also credit Tenet for this, the movie Tenet, because it has like crazy twisty time travel stuff and somebody drew out a timeline. Yeah, I had to watch that movie like like it was so difficult I had to go back and watch like certain scenes to figure out what the fuck was going on <laughs> well somebody drew out a timeline that was exactly like how I just described like where it's like left to right is is like linear time and then up to up and down is the timeline of the movie it changed the way I was even like thinking about time so I was like oh this is great this is perfect the way they laid this out so I tried to do that for this because I think it's a really similar concept as to that movie. So watch that movie. Do you guys think it would be different for Harper to kill Clara inside the house? And maybe it's different when he kills someone outside of the house? You do kind of wonder, like, what, what did he do with her body? 
Yeah, and I kept wondering that, like, is it just in the house rotting or did he like drag her out somewhere? We don't know. Probably a different timeline. Also, is the radium killing him slowly from the bed? I guess not, since he can't age. He probably can't die of radium either. Radiation. I don't know. I don't know if he can't age or if it's just that he's, I mean, he's time traveling. So like, it right. may have only been like a year in yeah. his life. Right. Yeah. All right. So where are we? Oh, God. Yeah. Her murder. Uh, so she starts <laughs> to leave and she says, and he attacks her and she says, get off me. Uh, you can come back as many times as you want. I will always know you watched me. I watched you. You weren't much back then. Now, all of this, it makes you look even smaller. And he pins her against the bed and starts punching her. Which is aggressive. I feel like choking would be more his style, but I was wrong. He's punching the shit out of her. You think that maybe he uh, doesn't want to actually go back to then as well because, like, she's just revealed how shit she thinks he is, even yeah. though it's kind of obvious that she's ruined we it. already knew. So why would he want to go relive that moment? Again, after yeah. he's killed her, unless he's, you know, a psychopath, which he is. So it's possible. <laughs> Do we also think maybe at the beginning, I mean, this is probably fairly early in his experience with this. Like, do we think that he might hope that it changes and that she might actually be more receptive to him? Yeah, I feel like it, the day was perfect, but now mm-hmm. she kind of realized what the hell's going on and she's kind of ruined it right for him for yeah. him yeah definitely i enjoy that and we're back in cantini and they're lifting dead bodies and crosses and the crosses shot is so cool but you see the handkerchief the smv that he cuts out and sews together scarlet had a really good point about this like he takes the handkerchief off of the dead the person that he kills mm-hmm. and then he gives it to his next victim and that's like mm-hmm basically first, what he's yeah. doing every time is taking some some of their possession one of their possessions and putting it inside the next victim very good point point. and then leo approaches and says we both made it i knew you'd make it when i saw you out there and he, harper's like how did you see anything with all that smoke and leo reveals that he saw him kill the guy you might want to leave that with him that's his mask right I told you I'd be right behind you. So Leo knows the kind of person that Harper is. I'm watching you. Yeah. I kind of wonder if that's why he like left him because he doesn't want him to know what he's up to, right? Yeah. Like why he left him in the in the bar. I was just looking yeah. at the lyrics for the next song because they're super relevant too. But that's when we finally hear the ballad of the absent mayor, which is the quote that Kirby Sharon wrote on the bar. Her quote that she wrote was, and they're gone like the smoke and they're gone like the song. But if you actually look up the lyrics to this entire song, it's pretty relevant. It's about him chasing his mare. And there's, it's just more of this like obsession chasing kind of thing. I did a little dive into Lenny, rest in peace. Is it going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're very familiar with him. So I found this great website called spiritrockmusic.eu. And according to that website, Leonard Cohen took inspiration for his ballad from a series of Buddhist woodcuts called Ten Ox Herding Pictures from the 12th century, which depict a boy trying to tame an ox, which is basically a metaphor of humans trying to tame the spiritual world and vice versa, you know, like a Buddhist trying to find the connection to the spiritual, kind of his path towards transformation and enlightenment which is also a concept that was a focal point of the Rosicrucian movement of the 17th century Europe, which I had to look up. And apparently they sought for the holy grail of existence, which in their eyes was uh, finding the connection to the the esoteric world. So um, very much like the Buddhist concept. But they depicted this connection in a symbol that was an actual cross, like the Jesus cross. And it had a rose placed in the spot of the intersection of the horizontal bar of mortal life and vertical bar of uh, the higher realm. And that kind of made me think of Harper, who not only cuts up his victims in Mm -hmm. the same matter of a cross or inverted cross, but also because he places something in the intersection, yeah. intersection of the cross, like the matchbook or the radium box. So once this happens, you know, when the human bar crosses with the spiritual one or when the boy finally tames the ox, they become one. And Leonard Cohen's uh, lyrics describe it here like that. 
Uh, and there is no space, but there is left and right. And there is no time, but there is day and light. And that kind of is how Kirby describes Harper in the first episode. She says, he's everybody, he's nobody, he's all the time. He's something that is out of time itself, out of space. But he's he is still tied to natural forces that rule reality like day and night and left and right. And, you know, knowing Harper, I mean, as far as we met him... I don't think he's interested in that at all. So it's not something he's doing consciously or it's not his motivation to somehow find the access to the esoteric world or what the Buddhists strived for. But I guess the creators of the show might have wanted to draw that connection by using this exact song of Lenny's for the second time. And I'm not sure why yet, but it's very interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. I feel like something about the cross also, like, matches the thing that we were discussing about the timelines too like about oh yeah the vertical and the yeah horizontal. time intersecting with his his timeline going vertically and Ooh. the world's going horizontally yeah, it would create crosses right or intersections yeah yep there's also 19 crosses and I remember when harper visited leo in his home and said 19 last one yeah we discussed that just being like the number of laps and he was going to take a 20th but i think maybe it means something else at this point well i've noticed that there are actually 22 victims but one is not having a cross on 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 top of him oh yeah and when the picture goes black and you see only the crosses there is uh, there are two victims who are covered by the priest so you don't see the crosses so it's actually uh, 20, 22 people yeah, 22. i have no idea <laughs> if it has any significance because we do see only 19 crosses okay yeah, yeah. it's interesting that we see 19 and that number was randomly 19 yeah. as well it's a cool shot there yeah. i love that shot of the crosses yeah yeah it's a really good shot i was gonna say the crosses are obviously um where harper drew his inspiration what he draws into his victims yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a note about it because uh, I remember that in a previous episode, uh, this reporter Lakshmi uh, uh-huh. had the, uh, they were uh, talking to Dan about what would be the, his motivations and that stuff, and yeah. and she says that it could be some bad memory connected to a cross, uh, but uh, I mm. mean the way it was shot, I don't know how to explain this, but the the, the way it was put on the bodies was upside cor- down, like, ups- yeah, right, uh, but yep. the way he sees them is inverted right exactly uh, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's why he maybe he uh, cuts his big things in that way uh, and so this memory for him is like you know like he has like it's a photographic picture. yeah exactly yeah. exactly like that and it's so interesting and i was thinking that maybe it was not a bad memory uh, but a good one maybe for him because i i think that he doesn't feel any remorse about killing this guy yeah uh it's not like survivor's guilt like his feelings are not that that right. those ones you know right. like maybe he is this this point is for him like this change because clara also says that okay he changed after the war you know mm-hmm. uh so this point is important for him but in that like it's like reaffirming who he is maybe that he was so makes him feel powerful I yeah think. i think so yeah, yeah. That's a really good point. Which makes sense, though, because twice in this episode, he was called a small man. Yeah. Both times that he was called that, he instantly got very violent. And so obviously, like, power is a thing for him. So that definitely checks out. You think he wanted to kill 19 people? I don't think he started out thinking, like, that's what I'm going to do. But I I think maybe as he started doing it, he probably... Yeah, maybe that is his goal. We know of eight. The newspaper article said 12, and I don't know if that was a typo Mm -hmm. or what. But so far we know... Well, now we know of nine because of Clara. Clara. Do you guys think that... um... That Kirby's earrings are what he left inside Jinsuk, what Harper left inside Jinsuk. Yeah, I wrote that note, and I think you're correct. And because we never actually saw, I think we saw him place something, something on like a table or desk before he killed Ginny, and we never saw what it was. But it did look a little bit like a book, like a almanac, like something small and flat. And is he taking it to the next mm. victim? Like, do we know the order of things yet? Because if the theory on the handkerchief, he gave it to mm-hmm. Clara, Clara, and that's I think, his next yeah. victim. And I mean, Jenny, I think that would make sense. Jenny and Kirby sh- should be far apart, right? Well, if he kills Jenny in his timeline after he, mm. right, 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 like theoretically, he yeah. thinks he kills Kirby. Yeah. Then what's actually kind of occurring to me about that is that now, like, it's possible that by Kirby stopping him, if Kirby is able to stop him from killing Jenny, Jinsuk, 
then that could theoretically like break the chain of Harper's like ability to kill people after her, like after her in his timeline. Yeah. So like the people that he killed, if he took, let's see, what did he take from Jin? Okay. Jin Suk's key, right? Mm-hmm. He put that inside of Summer. Yeah. So if Kirby stops him from killing Jin Suk, then that might also stop him from being Summer. able to kill Summer. And it might yeah. also then save Margot because Margot has Summer's compact mirror in her. So I'm just like wondering if Kirby stopping Jenny's murder is actually going to stop Harper from being able to kill like a bunch of people, a bunch of these women. That's really cool. Interesting. That's exciting. So now we are back at Kirby's bar and Harper is watching her clean up the bar and she asks, do you want something? She's super annoyed. Like last call, lights are up. Clearly she just wants to leave. And he says, same as last time. And she says, and that is uh, whiskey neat. And then he compliments her earrings and says, if you let me hold them, I'll tell you where they're from. And she said, they're not worth anything, but she lets him do it. And he says, not too old, two, maybe three years. A man bought them for you, but they're not nice for you two to have been together long. So maybe a gag gift on a first date. And she's immediately alarmed. So she lies and says they're from the dollar store and tells him to keep them, that she bought him. And he says, I was right or something. There's just a lot of Groundhog's Day in this episode, like trying to get the date right with the girl and learning stuff and then like replaying it. But I think this is the night he decides to kill her. Because she seems very, like, obviously he's telling her the story about how she got those earrings because he knows and she's freaked out by that. Because that's very specific to know that or to be able to guess that. But she does a decent job, like, hiding her fear. And she kind of, like, brushes it off, at least to him, and says, oh, you know, they're from the dollar store, you could keep them. Where she had just said, like, she didn't want to give him the earrings because she was, didn't want him to steal them. So I, it reminded me of that scene from that store when he was stalking that girl in the back room and she was like walking towards the door where he was telling her to leave. And then she realized it was a dead end and he seemed mad at her that she wasn't like strong enough. She didn't, she wasn't vocal enough to voice her fears and it made it seem like that wasn't the right time to kill her. And I think I had said back then that I felt like he was waiting for these girls to get their shining moment and then he can kill them. So I feel like this was her moment because she's kind of showing him that she's tough enough even though she's freaked out like I don't know tell him off I guess or not play the game not let it yeah like not let it affect her but he kind of gives her a look like after she tells him to keep the earrings like he's satisfied I think he's realizing like this is her moment now like she's she seems very shiny and happy and he seems he seems satisfied with the way she's acting like that's what he's looking for yeah and he went back there to see her without Clara so it's it's almost like he's moved on like he's finished fucking with Clara (laughs) now he's like going moving on to the next person and even with Clara like she was I think he could sense that like she wasn't being forthcoming with him as far as her feelings like she wouldn't tell him that she didn't get the letters she wouldn't tell him why she was hiding like her feelings from him and then when she finally called him out on it Uh and like said her true thoughts and like laid it all out there that's when he killed her so that's why that's I think, true. That's true. But that's why I think he's looking for these women to like have a certain amount of confidence. And then that's his moment where he gets to dull their shine and kill. Yeah. Them. And I wonder if maybe that, that that totally fits with Julia, too, because Julia tells him not to touch her. And then he kind of looks at her like, cool, I'm going to kill you now. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and then even when he kills her, like when he's stalking her, like on the phone and everything, it's like she got to the moment where she was, like I said, shining then he stalks her and watches her like sink into fear and basically become dull and then he kills her so it's like he's toying with them yeah yeah mm-hmm. and with Ginny too when G- he goes to see her pres- the presentation or whatever and Ginny corrects him yeah his theory right and I also thought about Lisa the girl in the grocery store because it's like he I felt like he was recruiting or something like it was like is it worth my time to you know, go through time and pursue these people, you know, so he's looking for something, you know, and is when they challenge him in a way. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say the girl in the grocery store was too easy. Yeah. He didn't, uh-huh. he didn't like it. Well, my theory is that he picks Kirby because she fucked up with his thing that he had going on with Clara. So yeah, and he's very jealous. It definitely starts hunting her now. I yeah. don't know how long it mm-hmm. lasts. And there is, uh, in the, when they were dancing, I noticed that the shot, when he is looking at them, right? And the shot is centered in Kirby. 
mm -hmm. like Clara is by this side. So yeah. I think at that point he is like focused on her. Yeah, you know why um, is Harper the one that interacts with the house and not Leo? Uh -huh. I had a little theory about that, and the theory is that um, actually he was supposed to die on the battlefield. And by killing the other soldier and taking his mask, he kind of steals his life and kind of gets thrown off his own life timeline. So mm -hmm. when he goes to the house, he's the one who can um, interact with the house and use the, the magic of the house because he should have died. He shouldn't be there at all. So he's kind of like mm -hmm. outside of his own. Right. Of what was meant for him in that timeline. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Either that or the, the dude could only pass on to one person. That is also true, yeah. I have just one note because I thought maybe I just read that. or I know I just interpreted that Kibi is the second victim. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if maybe that's why he, she survives because maybe Harper is not experienced enough, mm. you know, because it's the second one. But it's the first one that, that, that he kills intentionally in that way because Clara was like... I don't know like, it's like different you know because <laughs> yeah like well Kirby yeah. would have to be at least the third right because she has the be happy bar matched book in her so whoever is at the be happy bar was killed before before Kirby yeah right all right but I don't know why I mean well, I guess maybe we'll find out in the next episode about more about the be happy bar and who who that was all right. but I oh, think yeah, that we, have, we don't know who that is doing no. Mm -mm. No. but yeah I, I, it could be a lack of experience still though because he when he kills Clara, I mean, he, he doesn't, we don't think he cuts her up like that. Like, it's just, I guess we don't know. Or maybe Kirby is more personal to him because of the association to Clara. Maybe. And, yeah. you know, when things are per more personal, you might, there's more risk that you'll get it wrong. Well, and him, when he starts stalking Kirby, he, he does it on a time plane where she has never met uh, Clara. So they wouldn't, she, Kirby wouldn't have any memories of Clara in that. And maybe he would have put the handkerchief inside of Kirby, not the matches. Maybe, yeah. Okay, I think that's a wrap on our analysis of Shining Girls, episode six. That ran pretty long, but a lot happened in this episode. Come back tomorrow, if you're a Handmaid's Tale fan, for our deep dive into season two, episode 11. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.